So after we have relaxed a little bit, um, let's see what we can do with the, with the LLL. So consider, for instance, the case set. Um, <clears throat> So the concern here is that we, <clears throat> that whenever like two k sets share a variable in the dependency graph, we draw an edge between them. But are all those edges necessary? Because let's say they share a variable, but the variable is negated in both clauses. So should we draw an edge between them? Because after all, if this, this helps satisfying this clause, then it also helps satisfying the other clause. So the, the two clauses really don't antagonize with each other. They actually help each other. And you can put it in meta, into mathematical terms, saying that these two events, if this is satisfiable or this is satisfiable, they positively correlate. And you all know from probability theory that three events can either positively correlate or be independent, which means that the intersection is size is exactly the product of the two sizes. As some of my undergraduates believe that when they are independent, they are disjoint, but no, the, the, the intersection size is a certain number, and they are negatively correlating if it's less than this number. Um, so let's introduce the negative dependency graph. Uh, so again, as before, we have um, like a set of events, and we define a graph um, such that each vertex of the graph corresponds to uh, an event. So we have n events and nodes, um, and we connect now two vertices only if the corresponding events um, negatively correlate. Most and actually, but that's not really the definition. The definition is like this. That, what, that this is the precise criterion what should hold. That if I am looking at the AI and I am looking at like any set of AJs that are not in the neighborhood of AI, so they are they are not neighbors, the AJs are not neighbors of AI, and I am looking at so this intersection of the complements, then the conditional probability of AI on this intersection should be less or equal than the probability of AI. So this means that AI is not only negatively correlating with the non-neighbors, but it negatively correlates with um, all of these events. So that's what, so that's what we require. Um, and so now we can state what is called the lopsided low vast local, or a lopsided local lemma, which is due to Erdős and Spencer, that it's basically, it sounds exactly the same as the as the standard low vast local lemma, so let AI be a collection of events, except that now instead of the original dependency graph G, we are just looking at this negative dependency graph, which is sparser or equal than the original dependency graph, because you see that this condition, like, like if you are looking at the original dependency graph, then clearly this condition holds with equality here. Because then the non-neighbors are independent from AI, so this is in the sigma algebra generated by some non-neighbors, so AI 
conditioned on any element of that sigma algebra should be, the probability should be the same exactly as the probability of AI. So, uh, so here we are relaxing the conditions of the original Lovas local lemma, meaning that we are getting rid of some edges in the dependency graph. And so in this negative dependency graph, which is like not as dense as the original dependence, so has less edges, um, uh, we can still state the same condition. So if we find such ZIs, blah, 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 like if we can find such ZIs, then uh, we can conclude what we wanted to conclude, like it's the same conclusion. So now, I feel that last time it was um, like a, uh, <coughs> an undertaking to prove the Lovas local lemma. So see if we remember any of the proofs. So now let's prove the, let's prove the negative, this, this lopsided Lovas local lemma uh, based on how we proved the Lovas local lemma. And that proof turns out to be exactly the same. So here, let us test our memory. And actually, let me test my memory. And maybe you can help if I am wrongly remembering that um, the proof of uh, the Lovas local lemma. And let's see if it indeed, if, if, if we can relax our condition to the lopsided condition. So maybe first I should ask that, does anyone remember uh, in this assembly whether, that what was the main lemma we needed? So do you remember the main lemma we needed? So well, Sasha remembers, but here, there is someone rem remembers, so. So that's perfect, right? So the probability is less or equal than AI. Uh, no, 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 I'm sorry, ZI. So actually, you said better, ZI. So that's, that's perfect. That's how, whether good explanation or bad explanation, this is how all explanations of Lovas local lemma start. Now, maybe mine was a bad explanation, so let's try to see if we can make a good or the same explanation, but with understanding. So, so for this lemma to prove, so that was our lemma. So we used, well, those facts from probability theory. So do you remember what was a, B, and C in lemma one that we were, that uh, we need, needed to use for this lemma. So how did we proceed? Sorry? Yes. So that was the neighbors, and this was the non-neighbors. So within the S, so this was the sort of the neighborhood of I, of AI, so that's just neighborhood of I intersect S, and the S2 was the neighborhood of I 
complement will intersect S. Right? And S did not contain, so actually there were some things, like for instance, S did not contain I, right? So <clears throat> so these were the neighbors, and these were the non-neighbors. Yes, yeah, so, and then how, how was it? Uh, so A was what? So, I, so AI, right? Yeah. Now, and B was the, so it was S1. Well, what does it mean S1? That the AI, Complement, the AJ complement such that J is in S1, and C was the intersect AJ complement where J was in S2. So, what happens when we apply lemma 1? So then, actually, when we apply lemma 1, then on the left-hand side, right, so this is the S1, and this is the S2, but the S1 union S2 is just S. Right, so this, so B intersection C, which occurs there, is nothing but this. So the left-hand side was just probability of AI conditioned on just exactly that, J. And so we know that that's equal to, and so now probability of, so now A intersect B, intersect B conditioned on C, which is like intersect A, J, and J in S2, and divided by probability of B intersect C, and let me just write down. So that's the non that's the neighbors in S. Uh, so J is in S1 and conditioned on the non-neighbors. A J complement J is in S2. And so there was a trivial step here when I just simply um, omit the B. So when I omit the B, no matter what this expression is, that I should get just larger, right? Because it was an intersection, I omitted something, whether it's a conditional probability or not, I just get a larger thing. So here it's definitely well larger or equal. So here is definitely less or equal than P A conditioned. Well, I'm sorry, that was a complement. Intersect A J complement. And then you see there's too much writing, right? Too much writing for nothing, because once you see it, you don't even have to write almost anything. S2, so S, that was S1, and that was S2. And that was a division. Okay, so, so, this, so this is how we started, right? And uh, so now, well, let's, so let's, let's get back a little bit, so the loops, lopsided version. Um, so what does this condition says for a guy and for a bunch of guys that are its, its non-neighbors? 
right? It says that the AI conditioned on where this kind of intersection, where the probability is always less or equal than actually the pro pro probability of AI. Right? So can we, can we go from here? Sorry, we cannot. So now we, we actually we see a condition, because I am sorry, I did not try. So this is J from S2, which was the non-neighbors. Right, so all what happens here is, and that's how the lopsided proof differs, that's the only step where the lopsided proof differs from the original proof, that because in the original proof we just said that it was conditioned on the non-neighbors, but, non but it's independent on the non-neighbors, so this is PA, but here now it's not PA, but by the condition of of a negative dependency graph, it's something it's less or equal than PA. So that's the only, only way that it differs. So, so actually, um, So actually then in the denominator there was the PA and in the denominator there was the um, uh, probability of, so now the neighbors, so J is in S1, uh, AI complement conditioned on the non-neighbors. So intersect J in S2, A, I mean, sorry, A, J complement. Now, um, so do you remember what we needed to prove here? So what, what was that we, that we had to prove here? Well, um, so, what, so, so what we want to say is that, so this eventually we want to arrive at, so what, where we want to arrive at is, you remember how we started, right? And we wanted to arrive, so we started with the original expression of the lemma, right here, and we want to arrive that this is less than zi. And so we started with the original expression and we made these inequalities, and so far we are here, and we are yet to, we are yet to uh, get here, right? So there is actually a relation between PA and ZI, so this relation is provided by the assumption of the LLL, because the assumption in the LLL, you remember, was that the P A I was less or equal than Z I times the product of one minus Z J's where Z where J is in the neighborhood of I. Right? So actually the PI, well the PAI and the ZI, the PI is less or equal than the ZI, which is kind of starts to look good. And even it's not only that it's less or equal than the ZI, but also if I divide the PAI with this, so I take this out here. Um, uh, so if I take this out here as a divisor, it is still less or equal than the ZI. Right? So what really I have to go for is so if I can show that if this is less or equal, I mean if, I'm sorry, if it is greater, if it is greater or equal, so if 
P A J um, intersect, well, here, J in S1 and J in S2, uh, A J complement. So if I can show that this is great, uh, this is greater or equal than the product, well, this product, then I have proven the lemma. Right, because then I have proven that PA um, divided by product so I am I am down to having to prove this in order to prove the claim So now the question is how we prove this. And we are actually proving the claim by induction. And so we are proving the claim by induction. So now we are going to use this lemma too. Um, maybe I, I, I did not quite try the, I did not quite write the right lemma to here because I want to condition everything on an X. And all what that does is that when I am conditioning everything on X, then on the, then here, um, well here, I just have to put a condition on x everywhere. Well, here conditioned on x, and then here intersect x, intersect x, intersect x. Um, so, so this intersection I am just now writing as p a, let's say j1 complement, and a J2 complement and so these are the neighbors, right? These are the neighbors, A, J, L complement, or at least some of the neighbors. And here is these other guys whom I, on whom I and so and so, um, so now, uh, well, let's assume for a moment that I only had one of these. So I had, let's say, just A, some AL, probability of AL complement conditioned on, on these non-neighbors. Well, let's assume that I had just one of these. Right? Then, well, the thing is that, um, so now this S2 is smaller than S, um, so I can use the induction. So this is, of course, equal to 1 minus uh, P A L, so now without the complement and the same intersection, so the same condition, J in S2, right? And so now I am using the inductive hypothesis, which is that this is, that this is 
less than um, this is less than zi, I mean zl. So now I am using that this is less than zl. Therefore, this is greater than 1 minus zl. All right, so if there was just one of these, then I would have for this expression 1 minus zl. So now from that chain rule, I am getting um, exactly these kind of expressions such that, um, such that, so first I just have like one of the guys conditioned on this, and then I have, and then that guy, the first guy just goes to this side, and then there is the second guy, and then the second guy also goes to this side, and there is the third guy, and so forth. So each of those, by induction, gives a 1 minus z, well, I get the 1 minus zgl times 1 minus da da da. So all the, in the chain rule, I have to make the product of all those, and so those give me this kind of product, and so here I, and so, and so this, and so I get this product, well, not all of them, not the entire Ni, just so I know that the Ni actually, since it's all the neighbors, that it contains the S1, so just those. And of course, if I, if I just add it even more, then I am just decreasing uh, this product further. So this is how I am, this is how I am proving that. And so once I have the claim, So once I have the claim, um, then again, I am using the same chain rule. So from this claim, then using the same chain rule, then I can show that the probability of the AI compl A1 complement intersect, A2 complement intersect, da da da, A and complement is then less or equal than um, so so for, so then like the probability of a1 complement times the probability of a2 complement conditioned on a1 complement times the, so now I'm just using that rule, uh, A3 complement condition on A1 intersect A2, uh, da, da, da. And so now if I am looking at this product, like the probability, yeah. It's equal. I'm sorry, yeah. It's greater or equal. And so, I, I mean, it's equal, it's just equal. It's just simply equal. It's just simply equal, right? It says it's equal. But then it's greater, but then you are right, and then it's greater or equal. And then, so the AI A1 complement, well, it's, now I am decreasing it if I am writing 1 minus Z1 because Z1 is, is bigger than probability of A1. And here I am, if I am looking at that, I am 
decreasing it if I am writing 1 minus z2, because you remember that the lemma said that the probability of a2 conditioned on a1 complement, that this was upper bounded by z2, right? Therefore, therefore if I am looking at the a1 complement, a2 complement here, that that's going to be lower bounded by 1 minus z2. So I'm lower bounding here this by 1 minus z2. And here I am lower bounding this by 1 minus z3 and so forth. And that's what I wanted to prove. So simply, it came from those lemmas. And again, the thing was that notice that actually the lemma should have better said should have better been said like, eh, but of course, no one would say that way, that this and that probability of AI complement conditioned on, so now if I write complement here, J in S, but for didactically maybe, um, is of course it's greater or equal than 1 minus zj. So somehow I am using, well, this is, these are equivalent. I mean, this is equivalent to this. But if I am saying both, then it's clearer because in the induction step, I am not using this, but I am using this. And in the final step, I am also using this. But these two are just saying the same. So this is, again, the LLL proof. And, um, and you can marvel it. Actually, Joel Spencer just put the proof into his wall, into his office wall, because he thought it was just such a nice lemma. And the proof. Uh, well, he just liked it. And again, you can just think about it because he says that it's, it's still a mystery to him why it works. So if it's a mystery to you at this point, then you are not alone. You are with Joel Spencer, who, of course, and, and you should read his book with No Galon uh, about, trend, about uh, uh, the probabilistic method. Right? That's a famous book. Uh, Spencer, Alon Spencer book. And uh, this, this proof is featured there. Um, OK, so we have again proven the LLL. And moreover, we have seen that the lopsided version is true. So what else? Um, so what else? What else can we do with the Lovas local lemma? So what we can do is, and this is like a huge, I should say, a huge addition to the Lovas local lemma, is that we can ask. So so far, we just proved existence. But we are computer scientists. So we can prove existence like there exists a two-coloring or there exists a satisfying assignment. But can we find the two-coloring or satisfying assignment? And um, so after a long history of research, uh, the early history where it goes back to the 90s, but recall that the Lovas local lemma was from the 70s or 71. So actually, this new um, research should have been done much earlier, but some of it was just done now. Uh, it shows that, yes, we can, find, we can find the assignment. And very surprisingly, so this also gives a new proof to the Lovas local lemma, although only in the variable setting. So here is how you, here is how you find uh, the assignment. So, the, so look at this resample algorithm. 
So in the resample algorithm, you just pick a random assignment originally, and you hope that it works. So if it does not work, then there is an unsatisfied constraint. And in general, you just say one of the AIs is not, is not satisfied. I mean, is actually one of the AIs holds, because the AIs are the bad events. So the, the complements of AIs are the good events. So, and while you, while you find such AI, you just simply um, resample all variables in that clause. And, and when you can, and when, and you just simply keep doing this, and then, and then after a while, everything will be okay, no, you find no unsatisfied clause, and then you just output the final assignment. Of course, you can always say that, that let's try this. But what's fantastic about it is that this simple algorithm is proven to work in a very good expected running time as long as the LLL criterion, that very criterion that we are always using in the standard LLL, um, right, for instance here, like this very criterion holds, then uh, this always, um, this always, uh, this algorithm always terminates. So let's, let's just state it more precisely what we are claiming. Right? So let's, let's state the exact statement. So recall that the lowest local lemma has this variable version, which is the special case in which, like, which is like every application or almost every application is in this special case. So what was the special case? It was that we had like a bunch of random, independent random variables. And in the coloring, you just think about these random variables as do I color vertex i with color 1 or color 2? And so I independently color those. So these are those variables. So we have a bunch of independent random variables. And we have a set of events. So these are our bad events, a1 through a n, that depend only on the xi's. So, so depending on the xi's, and each ai well, they don't depend on all of the xi's, but the ai's depend on like some underlying xi's. Right? The, the hypergraph coloring, like the hyperedge, whether it's well colored or not, it depends only on those xi's that correspond to the, the vertices contained in that hyperedge. So, so, so that's the, this underlying set on which AJ depends is the vari variable set of AJ. And so we have said that if AI and AJ, the vari underlying variable sets, don't inter, um, don't, well, this, this says that actually if they do intersect, then, well, then AI in the depend dependent on AJ, so it, they are neighbors in the dependency graph and otherwise they are non-neighbors. So, so here we define the dependency graph in the variable setting, and um, so then we just, um, like again, write down this LLL, the standard LLL condition that there exist those EIs such that all these probabilities for every I hold, and then the conclusion is that the moser tardos algorithm terminates in this expected number of steps. Now, if you look at this formula, this formula is less than, is less than n, because the, well, because the zi's are typically small, and um, so, this, so all these terms are typically less than 1. So actually, this, for instance, for the k-set or for the hypergraph coloring, this is roughly uh, like 1 over 2 to the k. So, um, 
So, uh, so uh, this algorithm is going to terminate very quickly. Now, um, my, my yeah? Well, I, I probably lost, but could, could you please show once again what, what is more of the algorithm? Yeah, so I wanted to show it again. And so I wanted to show it again um, because in the previous slide, I was just telling it for the K set. But in general, um, it's no different from this. Right? Because what does it mean? It means that we have the events A1 through AN. And so in the very beginning, so in the first step, I am just setting like x1 to some random values, right? So I am just setting these independent random variables to some random values, xn equals rn. So these random variables, you should think of them as variables uh, over finite domains, but they can be orbitary distribution on finite domains. So it means that, for instance, like if x1 is like, let's say, 0 with probability, um, I don't know, half, 1 with probability 1 quarter, and 2 with probability 1 quarter, then I am flipping a coin, and then r1 will be 0 with probability half, 1 with probability 1 quarter, and 2 with probability 1 quarter. And so for every xi, I am creating an initial assignment. And then I am looking around and see if that which of these AIs hold and which of the AIs, well, so if any of the AIs hold, well, that's the bad event. So then if any of the AIs hold, let's say A1 holds, then I am looking at the variable set of A1. So let's assume that the variable set of A1 is, let's say, x1 and x2. So I'm just actually just writing down like 1 and 2. So then what I am doing is that I am taking x1 and taking x2, and I am drawing a new random sample. I'm drawing new random samples for these two variables. So that's how I resample uh, if I see an AI holding. And actually, in the algorithm, it does not matter which AI I am, I am picking out. I can pick out any which, which holds. And if none of them holds, then I am done. Then I avoided all the AIs. So, and actually, um, OK, so and then the, so the moser tardor theorem says that, that on expectation, this very simple algorithm is going to terminate in this number of steps. So the expected length, so that means the number of resamples. The number of resample steps on expectation is this at the most. Um, so here, basically, I just drew a picture which is sort of the same as this, uh, but just for the k-set case. So assume that, I, that my original uh, random drawing was 0 for x1, zero, 1 for x2, 0 for x3, 0 for x4, 0 for x5. So now if we look at this, then we see that the second clause is, uh, is not satisfied. So this clause C is not satisfied because like x2 is, is 1 and x4 and x5 are 0. So we have to resample all of these three variables. So after we resample these three variables, we see that now C prime does not, is not satisfied. So we might actually uh, inevitably or sometimes we, um, we um, 
we are unsatisfying something which was previously satisfied. But however it is, eventually the theorem says that we should get down to, um, we, should, we should get a solution. And so the proof of that is, since it's now 33 already, is going to be deferred to the next class. So we start the next class with proving the theorem of Moser and Tardos. Oh, thank you.